All right, we are back with a Thursday night edition of Seminole Sidelines. We're going to do a segment called Know Your Enemy a little bit later in the show. We're going to have Jermaine Every from Death Valley Insider, the LSU rival site, will be joining us momentarily uh, and look forward to getting his insight on the Tigers. We've got about 10 questions for Jermaine, uh, but obviously a lot of other stuff going on in Tallahassee in the state of Florida. Uh, obviously, Kurt, we did not see each other because of the hurricane yesterday. And uh, obviously, FSU was back to practice yesterday and today. Uh, and you just come out with an article talk, kind of drawing parallels to Jordan Travis's career as he's faced Brian Kelly a tremendous amount of times since he's been at Florida State. So uh, before uh, Jermaine uh, joins us, just to a, give us kind of some updates from practice today and then tell us a little bit about your article and Jordan Travis and where that idea came from and uh, how you drew the parallels. Um, so yeah, the we started practice this morning. It might be maybe what people care about a little more. I, I thought it was a good sending off. I think Mike Norvell, uh, Mike Norvell kind of talked afterwards about, uh, he thought it wasn't consistent enough. There was kind of a down period in the middle that didn't especially stand up to me. There's maybe a bit of sloppiness, but I think this team is ready to just to uh, play somebody wearing a different jersey. I think that's understandable as, uh, as far into preseason as they are, but, uh, Keon Coleman had a ridiculous one-on-one -on -one catch in the corner of the end zone, like in one-on-ones where he uh, went up, elevated, went up, caught a ball above his head, like well fallen backwards. It was just, I mean, it's what we've seen from Keon Coleman all, all preseason. Uh, Braden Fisk had a nice pass breakup. Greedy Vance, I thought, made a really nice play on the ball where he, uh, in 11 on, there was a catch over the middle and he just punched the ball out and kind of exactly what the uh, – what the staff wants to see. Fabian Lovett, very impactful again. Braden Fisk, very impactful again. Jeremiah Byers. It's kind of a lot of the same names we were talking yep. about in the trenches, and that kind of says something. But, I mean, you, there are a few guys who I've, I really liked there, and I've really liked a lot of what I've seen this preseason. Yeah, we can talk about the story. I mean, the story kind of – obviously, I think it came up in the press conference this week of somebody talking about I mean, this is obviously the fourth straight year that – Brian Kelly's had to face Florida State and Jordan Travis. It was his last two years at Notre Dame, now his first two at LSU. And I thought about, you know, that's that's funny. And 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 Bob and I were kind of brainstorming a what's a Jordan Travis story for this week. He's a guy who, I mean, we've written about him plenty. We write about him a lot, understandably so, but he's your your Heisman candidate quarterback. So we kind of what is the story going into this week? And I kind of landed on, I mean, realizing that those those games, the previous three games against Brian Kelly teams kind of mark milestones for Jordan. I mean, it was his first career start back in 2020 was against, was at Notre Dame yep. and that Florida state was uh that was not a good season for Florida state that outside of North Carolina was probably one of the brighter spots. They were pretty competitive on the road against the top five Irish team. And that was, I mean, it was an encouraging game from, uh, from Jordan definitely. And a, uh, a, a pretty, uh, prescient quote from Kenny Dillingham kind of the two days after I got asked about what he liked from Jordan and had a pretty prescient quote that's in the story just about uh how quickly Jordan took the coaching and was kind of putting what they were telling him as they were trying to teach him as they went into action and that he really grew through game action and that's kind of been the Jordan Travis story if you will year after obviously he split in time with Mackenzie Milton he again has Florida State in the game against Notre Dame but he didn't get to finish that game that's kind of the again though I mean through that year He's the best option at quarterback when he's out there. And then obviously last year was the statement. Last year was the, we know Jordan's the starter. What exactly is Jordan? And as it turned out, I mean, on that stage, he could not have handled that moment much better against a really good LSU team, as we found out later in the season. I mean, commanding the offense and just generally, I mean, kind of coming away with the signature win that Mike Norrell desperately needed. And now this year is the hype. I mean, yep. Brian Kelly is a good quote from Brian Kelly in there about Jordan and how, I mean, he just refuses to lose and how he's a winner and how that's, he thinks, one of the best traits about him. But also, I mean, he's had about as close a seat to anybody outside the program of Jordan's of Jordan's growth from his first start to now. And I think he knows the challenge that's ahead for his defense this weekend. Yeah, listen, it's going to be a tremendous challenge for uh, uh, the LSU defense with Jordan Travis, uh, Keon Coleman, uh, Trey Benson, Rodney Hill. Yep. Yep. Lawrence O'Feely. And listen, uh, of course, now listen, there's going to be challenges on both sides of the ball. I mean, you've got two elite pass rushers on both teams with Harold Perkins for LSU and Jared Verse from Florida State. So both offensive lines who uh, LSU feels like they're really good at tackle. Florida State feels like Byers is the answer at right tackle. They've got a veteran at Robert and Robert Scott at left tackle. And obviously, Bless Harris is able to go in and 
spare either one of those guys for whatever reason. So I, I think it's going to be. I think. Listen, we talked all uh, we talked all week about this as a both teams are full of similarities. So uh, you got two quarterbacks that are. They have the, they have ability to make plays with their feet and with their arms. A little bit different. I don't know if uh, um, Jaden's quite as elusive as uh, Jordan, but uh, we'll find out. But listen, the reason we brought you guys we're, are on the show tonight is uh, we've got Jermaine Every from uh, Death Valley Insider, uh, the LSU rival site, and Jermaine had some uh, little technical issues getting set up, but. Uh, Listen, we were supposed to have him on last night. Uh, Obviously, the hurricane blew through Tallahassee, which blew out my power, so I'm about 24 hours behind everything. Uh, And Jermaine, uh, first of all, we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, We know you're busy, and uh, we're going to put you one day behind, but how is everything in Baton Rouge? Oh, man, things are good. Things are good. Um, Hold up, I got a little reverb here. But, yeah, things are really good. I'm, I'm I'm happy, healthy. I, I really can't complain, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's well, football listen. season. None of us can complain. Yeah, we got we got a big one in about 54 minutes, and I think we're I think we're all, since we, we probably all three of us don't have any great feelings towards the Gators, so we're probably all three ready to watch see if Utah can uh, <laughs> beat, beat, beat the Gators without Cam Rising, who is uh, probably not going to start at quarterback. Uh, but Jermaine, I see that. Even the rivals network has an SEC budget. You got the microphone, the headphones. We have none of we have none of that. We got we're stuck on an ACC budget here. <laughs> <laughs> Man, honestly, I uh, I've been doing a lot of the uh, I've been doing a lot of sports media on and off since yep. like 2009, 2010. So, well, I was going to ask you, kind of give us your background, obviously. Death Valley Insider is new to the Rivals Network, but just give us a little bit of uh, history on where, uh, how you got in this business, how, why you chose to follow or work uh, for the site that follows LSU. I'm sure you're from Louisiana and all that, but just give us a little insight on uh, Jermaine Every. Uh, born and raised in New Orleans, um, grew up literally an hour away from LSU's campus. Okay, um, a little, little about an hour or so away from LSU's campus. Um, been like I said, been doing sports media on and off since 2009, 2010 uh, in in Houston uh, for ESPN 97.5 and Gal Media. Uh, worked for Gallery Sports for a little while, uh, just on and off, just doing some independent writing, video production, different stuff like that, and uh, came across Death Valley Insider and and you know just wanted to take advantage of covering one of the teams from back home. So yep. Now, did you grow up an LSU fan? Yeah, I didn't grow up an LSU fan per se. I just grew up rooting for the team. Okay. Um, I, I I was I'm just a fan of sports. Yep. Period. You know, like I, and, and it's weird because I'll get family members and stuff that get upset with my opinions on the hometown teams, and I'm like, I, I'm loyal to my pocket. Yes. <laughs> so I'm a fan. Like I'm a Saints fan. Yes, because I will die hard root for the Saints unabashedly. I, I don't care what you say. Like even when we were three and thirteen, going through the Katrina years and all of that, I still wore my gear. You know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm a Saints fan. That's about it. That's the only team I'm an actual fan of. Well, you got you got the deepest quarterback room in the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> and Derek Carr you know, and Jameis Winston. Sometimes they say if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have any. So say I'm a Falcons fan. We don't have to talk about that. Uh, 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 it's gonna be hey, listen, it's gonna be an interesting year in the NFC South. It's gonna be a, an intriguing year in the NFC South, but yeah. So all right, so we did not uh we did not call we did not set this up for us to talk about the NFC South and nobody watching wants to probably hear us talk about it other than us. So uh Jermaine, let's get started. We, we got 10 questions for you. Uh we're gonna try to uh not ex- ask too many follow-up questions or expound too much on what you say. We're kind of gonna turn the show over to you. Uh but mm-hmm. you know, obviously this is Brian Kelly's second year uh at LSU. Uh, you know Lost to Florida State in his opener. Uh, ended up winning ten games after that. I think they went ten and three after the Florida State game. Um, I expect you know a lot of people talking about uh, the SEC West title and all that. We'll get into that next. But what are, what is the biggest difference in this twenty twenty three football team versus LSU's team last year? 
I'm going to say the biggest difference to me is just the, the overall experience because the team had a full season and off season to go with uh, BK system. They had the offensive line had a lot of growth. Uh, so from them guys being tossed in the fire last year, uh, a lot of them, they, they've they never played an SEC football game. I think four out of the five guys who, who started last year hadn't even played an SEC football game. So when you look at those guys not only playing a full SEC season, but also going through BK's offseason program, training and everything, uh, the athletic trainers, the coaches, position coaches, especially because most people, you know, place fault and blame on the head coach, but they don't realize how much position coaches actually pour into what goes on on the field on a weekly basis. And to me, that time spent with those position coaches and those kids who are held over from last year to this year, there's been a lot of talk of uh, the veterans on the team, quote unquote veterans, the guys who were there last year and are still here this year, as far as being leadership to the guys who are transferred in and the incoming freshmen. So I just think the overall experience of the team has picked it up a level as well as the overall experience with the team and the coaching staff building that chemistry and establishing that culture. We know definitely the uh, the expectations around the Florida State side going into this. I mean, the, the fans are talking playoff. The fans have big expectations. I think the team itself has big expectations, obviously. Mm-hmm. What, I guess, inside the program and maybe from the fan base, what are the expectations for this this LSU season do you, in, from all you've been able to like ask, uh, ascertain? Uh, I think one of the biggest things is that this, this fan base now has a, a lot higher ex- – or their expectation level this season matches what they've always been in previous seasons. And to me last year, looking at the team, I didn't, I I was just hoping like, Hey, win at least eight or nine games, Uh, get used to each other, feel each other out because it takes a coach at least two recruiting cycles, in my opinion, to truly uh, change the team into the shape and the look that he wants it. And I think that after what they were able to accomplish down the stretch last year, making it to the SEC title game and having a good showing, Jaden Daniels like really turning it on towards the middle end of the season, uh, the defense picking it up. Um, I just think that fans' expectations now are a lot higher, and I think their expectations are going to meet with the team's end result because this should be a, a 11-1 and or 10-2 and season easily. All right, all right. Well, oh, so that those are good. Those are huge expectations, and not not unsimilar to the ones that are going around with Florida State fans, and I'm sure inside that program. All right. So I heard uh, Brian Kelly. I listened to his press conference on Monday, and he mentioned that when in seven on seven last year with Jaden Daniels, it, he every pass in seven on seven was almost like his first and 10. He was hitting the check down with the running back or check down with the tight end. And he says seven on seven this summer, it's been like every down is fourth down and that he's trying to get the ball. Like he's got to pick up the, the required yardage, whatever situation they're in, even as the first and 10, he's trying to get 10 plus so forth and so on. So uh, how do you feel about Jaden Daniels going into his second year in Brian Kelly's system? Uh, to me, a year older, a year wiser. Um, he's just, I remember seeing him play at Arizona state under Tony Dungy. And I want to say they went like five and seven that year. And I said, you know what? This kid's really got something like he's, he's long, lanky, really athletic. He seems like he has a really good arm, but if he got with the right coaching staff and had the right guys around him, I think that this kid could develop into something. Lo and behold, he transfers to LSU and Brian Kelly comes. I was like, Hey, you know that 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 meme from uh, the the Leonardo DiCaprio movie where he sits up in the chair and he he does the point. That was me. I was like, hey, that was that kid from Arizona State, and I was fully expecting him to, you know, be okay last year. But for him to turn it on the way he did, rushing for eight hundred eighty-five yards, you know, throwing for only uh, I think three interceptions, seventeen touchdowns last year. Uh, I think he ran for eleven touchdowns as well. So his uptick in production in him and the team winning and them going that far last year is the reason why he's the second betting favorite. I want to say at plus one thousand on Bet MGM to win the Heisman this year behind incumbent winner Caleb Williams. 
the next best betting odds are two guys at 1,200, next guys at 1,400. So it's clear that Vegas thinks that if Caleb Williams doesn't win, then the next guy up is going to be Jaden Daniels. Yeah, well, so one of those guys is that highly thought of. I think it's great, and I think it shows like his growth and development. Yeah, yep. it's kind of a, a double-edged sword though, where him being there, him having as many rushing yards as he led them in rushing, doesn't speak so great of the running backs last year. I know it was by, by committee to a to a degree, but I know John Emery's out again. I know I think a few guys are are banged up. What what's the state of that running back room? Who do you expect to kind of be the go-to guy or the go-to guys in that group this weekend? Uh, I'm thinking Josh Williams, uh, who took over last year, a uh, fifth-year senior. Uh, Logan Diggs transferred in from ND from Notre Dame, but uh, I think he's banged up. Uh, I want to say Caleb Jackson is banged up as well. Uh, so Noah Kane is going to be taking he, – he's taken all the uh, first-team reps, I want to say, all month. Uh, so look for Noah Kane as well as uh, Armani Goodwin. Uh, he was out. So once they get these guys healthy, I think they'll be in a good spot. But there's also another freshman, uh, Caleb. Caleb Jackson is the one that I think he. I think he might play. He might. He might not see action. But basically, Josh Williams is going to be the guy that's going to have to take over the load for this game at least until they can get some of those other guys healthy. But I think once uh, Logan Diggs gets healthy and, and Noah Kane comes comes in. Uh, and shows what he can do. Josh Williams, Armani Goodwin, you know, they got a good running back room. They just got to get these guys healthy. Yeah, I would read where there were a couple guys that were banged up. Then you add Emory on top of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I think one of the things that make Brian Kelly sleep better, at least based on his comments, was he really seems to think this offensive line he's got is going to be really good. Uh, I think he was talking about his entire team when he said this, but it was asked. He said it after he was asked about the offensive line that they are a more phys physical group than they were last year. And obviously, with Emory Jones and Will Campbell being true freshmen last year, uh, obviously more mature as well uh, mentally from a football standpoint. How good can the LSU's offensive line be? I know that it was. Uh, I don't know if, Kurt, you can help me, uh, but somebody came out and said L they thought LSU was going to run for 200 yards on Florida State. I don't know if that was inside the program or outside the program, but my point being, either way, it seems like they think their offensive line is pretty good. And oh. they gave Will Campbell number seven, which he obviously cannot wear. Right. Will, Will can't wear number seven, but he's going to be wearing a patch on his jersey uh, just to symbolize because that symbolizes – the biggest playmaker, the best player on the team historically for LSU. Um, this offensive line, BK, when he, he got there, he wanted them to be the focal point of the team. He wanted those guys to be the leaders of the team, to set the tone for the team. And it's obvious by Will Campbell getting bestowed the honor of wearing number seven for this season. Uh, and the way those guys gained experience and how they played – you know, down the stretch, it's no no coincidence that Jaden Daniels had the year that he had and, and was able to put up the kind of numbers he was able to put up because those guys stepped up to the plate. And so, like I said, just like I said with Jaden Daniels, a year older, a year wiser, a, a, another year with experience and a full offseason in this program with those coaches and whatnot, I just I can't see any dip in their play. I can only see it going up. And with the running back by committee thing going, because traditionally LSU will have at least one lead back, sometimes two guys that they can consider a lead back. Whereas now they're more or less going running back by committee. And I'm less concerned about the running back by committee and even the injuries at that position because of how good that offensive line actually is. All right. Well, uh, it, you, it sounds like, uh, you agree with what Brian said, and obviously Brian's been coaching a long time, so uh, a lot of tremendous offensive linemen play for him at Notre Dame and at Cincinnati, so he's, he's he knows what a good offensive line look, what looks like. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Kurt, I know you had a question uh, as it gets to the skill players. So there are definitely. I mean, Jade, we saw Malik Neighbors and what he became last year after kind of, I mean, the, the struggles in the Florida State game with, with returning punts in particular. He had a really special season. I think Mason Taylor was really impressive as a freshman tight end. Those are, I guess, the, the main known options that Jaden Daniels has to work with kind of in the passing game. Who are kind of those next guys up that Florida State fans should know about going into this game beyond, beyond Malik, beyond Mason Taylor? Um. My guy, 
Kyron Lacey. Uh, I was going to say Mason Taylor at tight end, but you specifically said wide receiver, so I'm going to go wide <laughs> receiver. But those were the two guys that I had pegged as, okay, outside of neighbors, who's going to be that next guy? You know, who's going to step up and say, hey, you know what? I can make plays too. And I think it's going to be Kyron Lacey. He only caught about 24 balls for about 260 or so yards and I think two touchdowns last year. But at six two, 215 pounds, he presents a nice big target on the outside for Jay Daniels. Uh, coincidentally, Mason Taylor, I think, is going to be another guy that's going to get an uptick in production as well because you don't have a Keyshawn Boutte there. So you can see Lacey getting more catches. But also with a guy like Mason Taylor, who's I think like 6'6", 250 or so, uh, there's a couple of other good tight ends that uh, uh, BK talked about uh, in a press conference a couple weeks ago that he likes those guys as well. I think there was an incoming freshman who's a, another big target. So they're, they're liking what the tight ends are doing at that position. So a quarterback's best friend is a big target, whether it's a tight end, whether it's a, a six foot two or plus wide receiver, or even if it's a, a good sized running back with soft hands coming out of the backfield. Um, I just really think that those two guys in particular are going to see an uptick in production. Don't be surprised if you have a tight end like a Mason Taylor being the second, maybe third leading receiver on this team this year. I would not be surprised at all. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same for Florida State. Jimmy yeah. Bell might be Florida State's third guy. He trained from South Carolina. And I tell you, Jordan Travis knows something about you talk about big receivers. Florida State's top two receivers are about to be six seven and six four. So he knows something about big receivers. Yeah, yes, what... trust me. Uh, I have some friends of mine who are salivating over those wide receivers, and they're like, gosh, I really hope we get a chance to draft one of those guys. That'd be great. And I'm like, guys, listen. Just because a guy is tall and big and kind of fast does not mean he can run routes and catch. I was like, those guys are really good, but let's let's let them develop and play or something before you get they like they literally started salivating about yeah. these guys before the draft this past year. Yeah. So they're already looking forward to next year's and the year after that draft to see those guys come out when they come out. I'm like, guys, calm down. What if something happens? Like, I don't want to wish anything bad on anybody, but <laughs> yeah, I, I am kind of nervous about that that six seven six four wide receiver that you guys got. But at the same time, uh, Zai Alexander, who's one of the uh, projected starters at corner for LSU, is about six two himself. So to have a guy that's six two and then Deuce Chestnut transferred in from Syracuse, he's five eleven. To me, a corner that's 5'11", 5'10", -ish. I still put stock in because if they're athletic enough to keep up with the big body guy, they're athletic enough to stay with him, be in his body, and like make it harder for him to make the catch if they can't jump up and bat the ball down. But I, I, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about that. But at the same time, I think that LSU's pass rush is going to give them trouble. Yeah, well, listen, the, these teams are mirror images of each other in a lot, a lot of ways, and uh, we're, that's a perfect segue to our next question. Uh, both teams are probably going to be without uh, arguably their best defensive front four player anyway. Uh, Florida State obviously wouldn't have the services of Daryl Jackson unless the NCAA flips his waiver, their waiver decision, and I think Kurt would agree with me. I think he is the best defensive tackle uh, Florida State has on its roster this year and maybe for the last 10 years. Uh, but if he plays, if it's a guy that plays up to his potential, a huge uh, bonus for Florida State, they could have had him. You guys are out without defensive tackle Mason Smith, who was coming back from an ACL uh, that he uh, suffered in the Florida State game last year. He came in with a ton of hype as one of the best players ever signed at LSU and certainly the number one player in his recruiting class. Uh, just how big of an impact uh, is him being out of the lineup to that? What? What kind of – how does that impact the LSU defense? I'm not going to lie. It's going to hurt. It, it, it is going to hurt. But to be perfectly honest with you, these guys have a next man up mentality. And I like to see that mentality coming from a team like LSU, um, a team that I'm covering and everything, because when you don't get down on injuries, suspensions, uh, you know, personal matters, whatever it is, when a guy is not there – and the next guy up says, hey, it's time for me to step up. Or if a guy moves on and transfers or gets drafted, what have you. When you hear guys talk about, hey, I have to step up and I have to help fill those shoes. Uh, they still have 
uh, Makai Wingo, who Wingo got the number 18. And the number 18 at LSU traditionally goes to a good model citizen, a good player, just an overall leader uh, in the community, on the team, so on and so forth. Uh, Makai Wingo is more of a three get a three technique, like a, 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 a Warren Sapp type of guy, the, the, the quicker defensive tackle who's going to shoot the gaps and, and kind of cause havoc that way. Whereas Mason Smith is more of a, I'm going to be the guy that's going to get double team more of a nose tackle type. So it, missing that anchor in the middle is going to hurt, but they got West Virginia transfer Jordan Jefferson, uh, Jacoby and Guillory and a Florida transfer Jalen Lee, who ready to step in and fill in next to Wingo in Smith's absence. So it's again going to be a defensive tackle. It's going to be a DT by committee, just like the running back is going to be by committee. They'll probably rotate those guys in and out. Uh, I could even imagine a scenario where on passing downs, they put more of the quote unquote NASCAR package that the Giants made popular, giving the Patriots uh, trouble and, and put those guys in, you know, more defensive ends and quicker defensive tackles to kind of make up for the loss of Mason Smith. One thing that I will be looking at in this game is how much Florida State tries to run up the middle to try to run at those replacements and see if they can challenge those guys and see what they can get away with. And I think early on, if LSU's defensive line, you know, establishes that that line of scrimmage and tells Florida State, uh, uh-uh, you're not running up the gut just because Smith ain't here don't mean it's going to be a cakewalk. I think that will help set the tone for the rest of that defense and let those guys know like, hey, Mason Smith isn't here, but I'm stepping up. And whenever you get a collective group like that and they say, hey, you know, I'm stepping up. So you got to step up. It starts to permeate throughout the team and it gives everyone else confidence. Yeah, listen, yep. now, there's no doubt that whoever is able to defend the run better gives themselves a huge, huge advantage in this game because uh, they yep. both got elite pass rushers on other side on, uh, on defense. Well, and we didn't see Florida State run the ball very well against LSU. I think the wild card there is I think the Trey Benson you're going to see Sunday is a different Trey Benson in the Florida State backfield than you saw last year. He was a guy who it definitely looks a lot different than he did a year ago. But, yeah, that was – frankly, Jordan Travis beat him with his arm, not as much with his legs or or with the running backs last year. We talked about a lot of good players in this game. I think, I mean, a guy who has the case of being the best player in this game all around. There are a few guys in that conversation – but Harold Perkins is right there for LSU. I mean, and that is a, especially for last year as a freshman, was a dude. But that Arkansas yes. game, I watched that. I was on the oh, road it was for a scary game. scary that and, game. Scary that day. Yes, he was incredible in that Arkansas game. I know Brian Kelly talked this week about, I mean, we're going to make teams account for They're going to move him around. I think he's going to be inside more, but they're also, mm-hmm. I mean, going to move him around. He's a guy who I know is hardly going to be in the same spot every time. How do you think he's going to be used now with a year under his belt? Florida State didn't see him last year, which was definitely a benefit for Florida State. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw it, but when you mentioned his name, my face lit up because yeah. <laughs> we have a few I guys like that. Who we could, if you asked us about them from this preseason, we would be talking like that. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's one of those kind of guys where I just enjoy watching him play. Uh, because there's there's not very many guys that you can see where they'll line them up anywhere. And uh, one of my favorite players to watch like that in the NFL right now is Micah Parsons, because the Cowboys will line him up at either defensive end spot. He may be at either outside linebacker spot. He may line up at middle linebacker. You just really don't know where Micah Parsons is going to be every play. Well, one thing you do know is you have to account for him. Um Isaiah Simmons, when he was at Clemson, he was used in a similar way. Uh, The Cardinals have used him literally at safety, corner, linebacker, uh, rush in. They've used him all over. I don't think Perkins will play much defensive back as in a natural, like, safety position. But I can see him playing the Mike, the Will, the Sam, either rush end. I can see him spying the quarterback, checking uh, tight ends and, and, and maybe even, you know, zone coverages against wide receivers. I, I don't know where they're going to use him. I just know he's going to be all over the field. So even if he did end up lining up at slot corner, honestly, I would not be surprised. He's that new type of hybrid linebacker where he's the size almost of a big safety, but Teams want those 6'1", 220-pound linebackers now because they want those guys to be able to move sideline to sideline, cover tight ends and running backs, and be able to shoot the gaps when they blitz. 
or or be able to run with a wide receiver in a zone if he has to or, or cover somebody coming coming out and, and if they switch up a play and you get caught in your base defense and they're going four wide you need an athletic guy who can probably run with some of those wide receivers on the field and that's the type of guy that perkins is and I honestly, I'm looking forward to seeing how many snaps he plays at different positions once the season is over with. Well, I think I think uh, Brian Kelly was right when he said on Monday that you've got to identify where Harold Perkins is and you got to identify where Jared Verse is and you got to try to try to negate them to the extent that you can in order to have to be as successful in offense as both teams want to be. But yes, listen. I think people are in for a treat to watch those two kids line up on defense in this game. And if the defensive lines come through, the other guys on the defensive line come through like you think they are for LSU and we think they are for FSU, boy, those guys could uh, really have – they could really have big games. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the things that Brian Kelly said at SEC Media Days was they got to get better on third down, third down defense. And in particular in that press conference, he called out the secondary. Uh, you guys have some questions at secondary, at corner, really. I think y'all feel pretty good about your safety spots there with two returning starters. Uh, but you did, you got two, as you've mentioned, Zy Alexander already and Deuce Chestnut. Uh, just who are going to be, how do you feel like those portal guys, what have they brought into the program? Uh, who do you like and who you think LSU uh, will play and FSU needs to be worried about back there? In the Man, the Chestnut and Alexander have stepped up big time because – they brought in uh, J.K. Johnson from Ohio State, as well as Denver Harris came in from uh, uh, A&M. A&M yep. Both guys, you know, pretty highly touted uh, recruits coming into school, uh, transferred for various reasons. Uh, Johnson is actually injured right now, and, and, and Harris is dealing with a personal matter, as it was labeled with, the, with uh, BK. And just those guys being out, but seeing Ashton Stamps and Latarish Welch step up as their backups – and see Chestnut and Alexander come in and establish themselves as starters. I just think that once they get Johnson back healthy and if Harris can clear up his personal issues, they're pretty much six deep at corner with those two returning safeties coming back. So if you look at that back end of that defense, you know, yeah, they may have to have piecemealed it together, but I got faith in those guys to be able to hold their own because the linebackers in the D-line in front of them and the safeties, you know, playing alongside of them are really, really good. So to me, I've always been under the philosophy that if your front seven is good, is good enough, your back four can be okay. Their back four is better than okay. And their front seven is really good. So I think that back four, will back four or five, six, however they line it up, I think those defensive backs are going to look a lot better because that front four and that those linebackers are so good. So it may not be the advantage that we think it is for Florida State because <laughs> I, I, I really paid attention to that comment that Brian Kelly made in the uh, SEC Media Days press conference. So yeah, Those guys are talented. And one of the things that I really picked up on is that Deuce Chestnut has really like kind of established himself and he's already ingratiated himself in the community. He's loving the food and everything. And so it's not just, okay, let's come in and see what we can do about playing. Like these guys have already come in, established bonds and things like that. And they're finding out things that they like about, you know, being on campus. And it's like from watching press conferences and post game. Uh, I'm sorry, post-practice coverage and whatnot, it really seems like these guys enjoy being around each other and these coaches enjoy coaching these guys. And whenever you get that type of chemistry, it's always set up for a good season. All right, well, uh, we got one more question for you. This is about the first time we've ever kept anybody on time. I'm so proud of us, Kurt. We're usually over. We always say, hey, we only need 20 or 30 minutes. An hour later, we're still talking to the guy on the other end. <laughs> He's looking at his watch saying, don't you guys have anything else to do besides talk football? Man, so I'm, I'm trying, trying to keep football. my answer short because I'll get diarrhea of the mouth and yeah, yeah, going. Yeah. So I'm trying to, like, remember, okay, remember when you used to do radio and you used to have to kind of talk in and out and you had a three-man booth? Like, you got to kind of make your point and be quiet. So I'm trying to help you guys out as well. <laughs> well, all right. One more for you. Uh, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, what are your expectations for this game? How do you see it playing out? Who do you think will win? I think we all know who you're going to say to answer the last question. But how do you see this game playing out based on what 
you've seen from LSU and what you've heard about from Florida State? I, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, and I think LSU wins and covers the two and a half. Okay. I had the final score being 31-27. All right. All right. Uh, well, I, I don't see this as a runaway win for LSU because Florida State is way too talented for that. I got to give you guys your respect, you know, that it's due. Uh, I'm not one of those people that's going to say I'm going to cover a team and then I'm going to become a fan of the team. I'm going to be objective. You know, the defense missing Mason Smith, uh, you know, the DBs, you know, uh, even though they've established themselves as starters and the other guys have established themselves as backups and they got the two returning safeties and whatnot in the D line. Like what if they get caught out on an island by themselves? You know, you got six, four and six, seven against five, eleven and six, two. Like, it's just humanly impossible to make up that difference. So you could get a situation where you got some jump balls that may go Florida State's way. Uh, I would expect that. Uh, you may get some times where these guys may break a run or, you know, get something up the middle because Mason Smith is there to plug that hole. I expect that. Um, I respect what Florida State brings to the table, and I also know that LSU has some deficiencies that Florida State can very well take advantage of. So I don't think it'll be a runaway game. I don't think either team will pull away from the other. I think it'll be a really close game. I think LSU will pull out the win. Hey, if, they right. keep, uh, if they keep Florida State under 30, that'd be impressive. I don't think many teams will do that this year. Yeah, let's not then see, there. that's why I you saw when I gave the prediction, yep. I said 31-27. Yep. They'll get like right there. But just, I think – I think it'll come down to one play. I'm with you. Uh, I think it's going to be a track meet. I think it's going to come down to one play. I think we're going to see a ton of points put on the board. I think, uh, I think, I don't know what the over under is, but I'd definitely take the over because I think you're going to be uh, over 60 points scored in this game easily. It's, it's crazy because you know what, Pat? I wouldn't be surprised if we saw like a 45 38 shootout. Well, I just sent my prediction to your uh, guy, Jefferson, because I was doing something for you guys, a little. Uh, prognostication. I got 38 36 Florida State. So uh, I think it's going to be a track meet. But, hey, Kurt, you got any final questions for Jermaine? No, I think I, let's play ball. I'm ready. All right. Hey, Jermaine, uh, we know you're busy. You're as busy as we are. And uh, we know sometimes this is not convenient to do. Uh, but we certainly like to give our viewers and subscribers uh, some a little additional insight that they may not get. Uh, from other sites uh, uh, who don't ask the opponent to come in and talk about their football team. We like to kind of uh, see both sides of it and uh, helps educate us, helps educate our uh, viewers and subscribers. So we want to thank you. Uh, who you got? Uh, we'll ask you one last question. Who you got tonight, uh, Florida and Utah, and who do you have, Minnesota and Nebraska? Ooh, I'm going to say Minnesota because I got a cousin who played ball up there. All right. uh, so I got to go with them. If he hears this or sees this and knows that I picked against his team, I know I'll have to hear about it at the next family reunion. So I'm going to have to pick Minnesota. All right. All right. <laughs> and that Florida Utah game got a lot more interesting with the quarterback position. So oof. if I had to just be on the spot like that, I'm going to have to go with Utah. All right. Flo Kurt, I'm going to give you the pick the games, Florida, Utah and Minnesota, uh, Nebraska. Oh, give me, give me Utah. Florida hasn't played outside the state in a non-conference road game in 32 years. Okay. All right. And, and give me, give me Minnesota. I'm with you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and set the world the back. We're going to come back to a little bit even. I am going with the Florida Gators because I don't think a 13 quarterback is going to beat Florida uh, on the road or otherwise. And I think Graham Mertz is going to be a little bit better than everybody's expecting him in Billy Napier's offense. This is not the same offense he played in, nowhere near what he played in at Wisconsin. Uh, he is a guy that can move a little bit, so I think play action will help him. Uh, and then, of course, uh, listen, I'm always going to pull for the boat to be sink in Minneapolis. I'm going with Nebraska and Matt Rule. Rule, <laughs> Matt Rule will own the day. He's going to torpedo. Uh, what's it? PJ Flex boat. Uh, so, anyway, hey, listen, I'm just glad college football is here. Uh, yes. there's, there's a ton yeah, to talk about. Listen, I didn't even get into the NC State UConn game, which I think could be a surprisingly good game tonight. So, yeah, man, uh, uh, I am I'm so with you guys on be, just being happy college football. Yeah. There's just but, something about waking up on Saturday and turning on your TV and you see crazy fans and the signs yeah. at college game day and just you know the the tailgating and just uh, the the atmosphere, you know, and and it's not even just college football is high school football yep. because 
you know, I, I'm I'm actually in Texas, and there's just so much like high school football is a religion here. You know, yes. when I'm in Flavor Louisiana, it, it's hugely important. Um, a side note: the over and under for that Florida State LSU game is 56. I'm oh, definitely, uh, definitely take the over. over. Definitely over. Definitely taking the over. Yeah, we yeah. all agree on that one. All right, Jermaine. Listen, we know we got all, all of us have some football we want to watch. It started about ten minutes ago on the ESPN with ACC kicking off, and then obviously uh, the two national games tonight at eight and ten. Uh, but Jermaine, hopefully, we'll see you in Orlando. Uh, if you're coming, uh, we look forward to catching up with you, meet you in person. But certainly, thank you for your time. If you're a YouTube uh, Osceola YouTube subscriber, but not a Osceola subscriber, please go to theosceola.com or floridastate.rivals.com and consider subscribing to the Osceola. We appreciate you listening, but we'd love for you to read our practice reports every day. And obviously, as we talked about earlier in the show, Kurt's got a great article on Jordan Travis's growth as a quarterback and how that kind of relates to his games against Brian Kelly. So uh, I, we just we just printed our uh, or printed. I'm still stuck back in the old days. We just posted our written preview of the LSU Tigers. We talk, It's very LSU-centric, talks about them uh, in depth. But uh, you can go to theosceola.com or floridastate.rivals.com and sign up for a subscription. Kurt, one last thing. Okay. No, I, th- I, th- I, th- I thought you were going to do Okay. okay. You're right. you're hey, you're Jermaine, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you down the road. And yes, of course, uh, uh, hope that you have you guys have a great season. Other than Sunday night, I hope we have a good Sunday night <laughs> and uh, have, <laughs> have a hard time waking up because uh, we had a good time on Sunday night after the game. But anyway, I, I hope you guys have a great Sunday night. I just hope mine is better. Yeah, we get it. We get it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us, Jermaine. If you're watching on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. If you're listening on our podcast and uh, look forward to those guys that we li- uh, look forward to you, those will listen to this tape. But uh, everyone have a great opening weekend of college football and we'll be back uh, later in the week. Yeah, you guys take it easy, man. Appreciate y'all having me on. Thanks, Jermaine. All right. Bye-bye.